the Jets need to create some salary cap space this offseason. There are plenty of players on offense who are expensive and could be cut to create that cap space. We're talking potential cap casualties on the offensive side of the ball today on the Locked On Jets podcast. You are Locked On Jets, your daily New York Jets podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome, this is the Locked On Jets podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. It's Tuesday, February 7th, 2023, and I'm your host, John B. from GangGreenNation.com, thanking you for making the show your first listen or first watch every day. This podcast is free and available on all platforms, including YouTube. If you like what you see or hear, hit the subscribe button where you are watching or listening so that you'll never miss an episode. If you're listening on a podcast source, please give the show a five-star review. If you're watching on YouTube, please give this episode a big thumbs up. These things help the podcast out and help other Jets fans find Locked On Jets. Today's episode of Locked On Jets is brought to you by Nissan. The only thing more exciting than the big game is the all-new, all-electric 2023 Nissan Aria. There's only five days left until the Super Bowl. Are you ready? The Nissan Aria, the EV for people who love to drive. Learn more at NissanUSA.com. Of course, the Super Bowl is just five days away. It will be the Philadelphia Eagles against the Kansas City Chiefs this Sunday in Arizona. It will be the official end to the NFL season, although the Jets season ended about four weeks ago, and we are focused on the offseason here on Locked on Jets. The Jets enter the offseason in need of some cap space. They actually are a little bit over the cap right now, and they will make some moves to free up cap space. There will be probably be some restructures. There also could be some players taking a pay cut, and there could be some players who are just cut. And on today's episode, we're going to talk about three candidates on the offensive side of the football who could be released in order to create the cap space the Jets need. Now, I think on the offensive side of the ball, it's kind of easy to cut guys because the Jets offense was not very good this year. And a lot of that was based on the quarterback play. A lot of it was based on the offensive line, particularly injuries on the offensive line. But when your unit is not very good, it makes it a little bit easier to cut players because you kind of have the mindset of, if this guy was really that good, why are we so bad? Why were we so bad on offense? Now, maybe that's not entirely fair because any individual player could be very good. And you know, football is a team sport. It's not like basketball where one player makes that much of a difference. But I think if you look at the Jets, I mean, there are some pretty clear places you can look to make cuts this offseason. But there are some decisions that are a little bit tougher than others. And I'd like to begin by talking about Corey Davis. Corey Davis, a veteran receiver, a guy who has had some good moments with the Jets, but has been inconsistent, if we're going to be honest, through his career. His first year, I think, was pretty disappointing. Lots of bad drops, although he did have a couple of good games that people tended to forget about. And kind of the same thing this past year. It's tough because I think you can make a case either way for Corey Davis, whether you want to keep him, whether you want to get rid of him. Now, let's talk about the financial implications of potentially cutting Corey Davis. Davis is entering the third year of his contract, and typically, unless you are giving out a contract to a superstar... Or if you're Mike McCagnan and you give C.J. Mosley a contract, guys are pretty cuttable. There aren't many players who you owe a lot to after year two, and that's just the way NFL contracts works. Most of the deals, the guarantees are front-loaded, so there's typically not a lot left when we're talking about what you'd take on in dead money if you cut a player after two years. And dead money is essentially money that you've already paid a player but has not been charged to your cap yet. And... The best way to think about it is when you cut a player, all of that money, that money that you've already paid him but hasn't been charged to your cap yet, that bill becomes due immediately. That goes on your cap this year, and that's what dead money is. Now, Corey Davis doesn't have much dead money left. Um, If the Jets cut him, he would only count for $666,000 in dead money, and his salary is about salary from for 2023 would be about 11.16 million so over the cap.com tells us that if you subtract those numbers davis would save about 10 and a half million dollars against the cap if he was cut it's a tricky call now yesterday show i talked about this quite a bit because i mentioned elijah moore and i think elijah moore's status could play a role in whether the jets keep davis or not because if the jets don't believe moore is going to step up if the Jets don't believe Moore is going to develop, or if the Jets trade Moore, 
it becomes more difficult to cut Davis because you don't want to go back to the days where you're throwing, you know, I think back to the days of Geno Smith where he was throwing to the David Nelsons of the world or, you know, Sam Darnold throwing to the, um, I don't know, who, who the receivers, Jermaine Curses of the world. I mean, the, the ridiculous receiving quarter the Jets would put out for some of these young quarterbacks. You want to have a competent professional receiver. And that's what Corey Davis is. Corey Davis is a cut above some of the receivers the Jets have put on the field. He's a solid veteran receiver. And there's something to be said for competency in a veteran receiver. The thing with Davis is he's not great, but he's not paid to be great. And I think this is one of the things that's been unfair about Corey for Corey Davis. So Corey Davis was signed in 2021, and this was right after an era where the Jets were always making splashy signings. So there were always these huge expectations that came with Jet signings, especially the, the bigger names. Davis was signed, again, his contract, his salary was just a little over $10 million dollars. If you look across the league, that's not what number one receivers are making. That's less than half of what number one receivers are making. Davis was really brought in to be a, a quality veteran receiver. Now, I think there have been moments where he's succeeded and moments where he's failed. And even if you go back to Tennessee, he had a reputation for being very inconsistent. It's, it, it's a tricky call. It really is because I don't know that you're necessarily going to be able to get a receiver, another starting caliber receiver for you know, around $11 million or $10.5 million, however, however much the Jets would save by cutting him. On the other hand, I feel like you kind of owe it to yourself to try and do better than Davis. And that's just, that's the story of Corey Davis. He's good enough to that he's going to have a job. He's not good enough that he's a lock to stay. And when I look at this situation right now, I feel like it's almost a spot where the Jets should hold on to him until they have the better option secured. Now, this is going to be a tougher year for the Jets. Last year, there were plenty of number one type receivers who changed teams. And then there were even guys who allegedly were available on the market. You know, there was talk about Debo Samuel, who eventually stayed in San Francisco. But there was clearly talk that Debo Samuel could be available. I don't know that we're going to see as much movement this year, which means you're turning to the draft. But here's the thing about the draft. Let's say the Jets, let's say the Jets pick somebody in the first round or the second round. I don't know that you really trust a completely young uh, receiver group because you still have Garrett Wilson. Now, Garrett Wilson, you know, is good. But after that, you've got Elijah Moore, who's a huge question mark. You've got another receiver, you know, another rookie receiver. You don't know what you're getting from a rookie. And I, I might just talk myself into the Jets keeping Corey Davis because unless there's a better option out there, I don't know if they can do it. As much as they might need the money, I just don't know that they can necessarily do this. So does that make Davis perhaps a candidate for a restructure. Well, he's in the last year of his contract. The Jets could add, you know, the Jets could rework his deal. They could add extra years to it. They could even uh, add what are known as void years, which essentially mean that you kick the salary cap charge to a future year. It doesn't necessarily extend the contract. It just means that it gives a mechanism that allows teams to push cap charges to future seasons. I mean, that could be an option. I wish there was a better, op I wish there was a better choice. And again, I, I, I go back and forth on this, and tomorrow I may feel differently. Tomorrow I may feel like Corey Davis has to go, but you know he's been a decent receiver for the Jets. He hasn't been a terrible receiver. Now, of course, he also doesn't play enough. He missed. He only played nine games his first season. He only played 13 games his second season, and he's only had one year in his entire career where he's played 100% of his team's games. That was 2018. He's always good to miss a couple of games for, for your football team, but in the lack of a better option, again, I don't think he's necessarily a bad value. I think that you have to look at keeping Corey Davis and trying to find your cap savings elsewhere. And I know that'll be controversial. I know that'll be hotly debated. I'd be interested to hear your take on that. Now, head here on the Locked On Jets podcast, there's another guy whose status is kind of up in the air. He plays tackle for the Jets. It's a position where every, nothing is clear. The Jets brought him in on a multi-year contract during training camp. We're going to talk about Dwayne Brown's status as we continue this Tuesday episode of the Locked On Jets podcast. This episode of Locked On Jets is brought to you by Prize Picks. Are you a daily fantasy sports player? Well, if you are, Prize Picks could be the game for you. Here's how it works: you pick two to six players, and if they score more or less than their Prize Picks projection, you can win up to 25 times your money on any entry. There's no competing against other people. It's just you against the projections available. Of course, the Super Bowl is coming up on Sunday, so you can 
use prize picks to play daily fantasy with the Super Bowl, but you can also play other sports. After the NFL season ends, there's the NBA, the NHL, there's men's and women's college basketball, soccer, esports, NASCAR, which is beginning soon, tennis, MMA, boxing, and yes, disc golf. Entries can be made in 60 seconds or less. It's just that easy, and they have safe and fast withdrawals. They are also currently operational in over 30 states and in Canada. So download the PrizePix app or go to prizepix.com to sign up and play Daily Fantasy Sports. First-time users can receive a 100% instant deposit match up to $100 with promo code Locked On. So if you deposit $50, PrizePix gives you another $50. If you deposit $100, PrizePix gives you $100. And don't forget to enter promo code Locked On at sign up for an instant deposit match of up to $100 using PrizePix. Thanks for making Locked On Jets your first listener, first to watch every day. This podcast is free and available on all platforms. Today we're talking about players on the offensive side of the ball who could be cut to make cap room for the New York Jets. We've talked about Corey Davis. Let's talk about Dwayne Brown now. Dwayne Brown, interesting case, because the Jets were looking to sign him as a depth player back in August. Very easy to forget about this. The Jets actually, at that at the point they started talking with Dwayne Brown, thought that they were set at the tackle position because they were counting on Mekhi Becton and they were counting on George Fant. And they were kind of concerned with their depth. Well, they became much more concerned with their depth shortly after because Mekhi Becton suffered an injury. So it became a spot where the Jets felt like they had to sign Brown. It was kind of an emergency signing. Jets brought him in and then you know, kept having tackles go down with injuries. In fact, Brown himself began the season on injured reserve, despite barely playing in the preseason. I still am having trouble figuring out exactly how that happened. But he did come back and played through injury. He was on the injury report every week, so we know he was he was still playing hurt. And you know, in some ways, I, I respect that because this is not a guy who really had a heck of a lot to prove. This is a guy who's been an excellent player through his career, you know, the multi-time pro bowler, you know, 36, 37 years of age. A, we were not expecting the Jets to be a team that was necessarily going to be in the playoff mix at the start of the season, but he went out there and he kept battling and he was okay. You know, I, I don't think he was anywhere near the pro bowl level of his past days, but he played decently while he was out there. The question is, how much does he have left in the tank? Because again, this is clearly not a guy who is in his prime. This is a guy who's nowhere near as good as he used to be. Will he continue to play? Well, we don't know. I mean, Dwayne Brown might take the decision away from the Jets because he's clearly near retirement age at 37 years old. The Jets signed him to a multi-year contract, and part of the reason they signed him to a multi-year contract was that they just did not have a lot of cap space left when at the point they signed him. And you know, this was not great. I got to be honest, this was not great cap managed by management by Joe Douglas. The fact he had to sign a guy as old as Dwayne Brown to a multi-year contract. You know, there are good things Joe Douglas has done. Lately, the cap management has not been so great. And when you have to sign the guy, and not only that, they added what are known as void years. I just talked about void years in the first segment, where they essentially kicked the uh, salary cap implications down the road. And it's just not very good cap management. But the Jets were in kind of a desperate situation because their plan at tackle did not pan out. Mekhi Becton got injured. Now, because of the way this deal was structured, Brown does not necessarily give you a whole lot of cap savings if you cut him the conventional way. And he's, uh, his, the dead money would be about $6.3 million. His cap number is about $11.2, $11.3 million. So you're only talking about $5 million in savings if he's a conventional cut. And again, that's because the Jets you know, just didn't have enough cap space. So they had to push some of the cap hit from last year's salary to future years. The Jets do, however, have an option. If Dwayne Brown is what's known as a post-June 1st cut, and that's kind of what it sounds like. The NFL has some weird rules, but if you cut a player after June 1st, you can then stretch the cap hits, you can stretch the, the, the dead money hits over multiple seasons. So if they do that, then the dead money hit goes down for Brown. Again, if, it's, if he's cut before June 1st, it's about $6.3 million in dead money. If he's cut after June 1st, it's about $1.5, $1.6 million. So, you know, pretty substantial difference. Now, the rest of that money gets charged to the Jets in future years. So it's not like that just disappears. Sometimes people talk about June post-June 1st cap hits as though it just makes the cap hit disappear. It doesn't. It just pushes it further to future years. But because the Jets are so tight up against the cap, it's something they're going to have to do. And it's kind of weird because I just told you that Last year, that's what they did. They essentially 
push the, push the price to the future. They push the payment to the future. Essentially, they're in a position where they have to do it again. It's not great, but it's where, where we are. But again, if ground is cut after June 1st, Jets only owe about $1.5, $1.6 million in dead money. His The cap savings from cutting him, Jets then save $9.7 million. You create $9.7 million of cap space, which is something the Jets really need right now. I feel like this is this one's a no-brainer. Davis was tough. This one's a no-brainer. Brown is getting old. Jets need to figure out the tackle position. I don't think Dwayne Brown's the future at tackle, though. I mean, he's already he's really not much of a run blocker for the Jets. I think I still think with Brees Hall back and with the quarterback situation on settle, it could be a team that runs the ball an awful lot. Brown is not much of a run blocker, and his pass blocking, you know, a little shaky. And you know, listen for a guy who had been durable much of his career. Listen, he's getting old. I don't know if you can count on him to stay healthy anymore. He clearly was playing hard at points during the season. So I think this is a guy you have to cut. I think it's got to be a post-June 1st cut. Now, one caveat here is, and this is weird, you can you don't actually have to wait till June 1st to make a player a post-June 1st cut. I know that's really weird, but you can essentially say, this player is a post-June 1st cut. You can do it, you know, you can do it in March. And essentially the cap implications are the same as if, as if the player was a post-June 1st cut. So that's a little bit of a weird quirk in the NFL rules, but that, that's the way that's the way it works. But I think Brown's clearly a guy, and listen, it, it's painful that the Jets have to are going to owe as much in dead money with, for this guy as they are because it's bad contract. It's bad contract structure for a guy that old to have that much money guaranteed over multi years, or at least to have dead money figures in the future. But it's where we are, and it's where the Jets were in the off season. They felt they had to get somebody in after Becton got injured. I think Brown played reasonably well. He was fine. You know, I think he, he was better than what the Jets would have put out there. I mean, I think he was a better, better than the season of Connor McDermott or Remmers or, you know, whoever, Obwehi or whoever the heck they would have put out there at the tackle position otherwise. But, you know, you wish you, wish you had better options. The state of the tackle position is very much up in the air for the Jets. If you follow mock drafts, and mock drafts are not always right, but most of them have the Jets taking a tackle at 13 if they keep the pick. That seems pretty logical given how big of a need it is and how important the position is. As much as you love, as much as you may like the idea of maybe Brown being there for one more year to mentor a young player, I just think you know the Jets probably got the last football out of him that he's going to give last year. His it doesn't seem like he can hold up physically anymore, and I, I think you you just take what you got. I, I don't know that you can do anything more. Now, hey, you're on the Locked On Jets podcast. We'll continue to, to talk about potential cap cuts for the Jets on the offensive side of the ball. And I'm going to make some people upset because the next guy I'm going to talk about is a fan favorite. Will Braxton Berrios be back with the Jets next season? Should he be? I'll tell you what I think as we continue this Tuesday episode of the Locked On Jets podcast. This episode of Locked On Jets is brought to you by Built Bar. If you're looking for a delicious treat but do not want all the fat and calories, then you have to try a Built Bar. We're kind of removed from the holidays now. I hope you've been keeping your New Year's resolution. Maybe it was to eat a little bit healthier this year, but you don't want a compromised taste, well then I've got the bar for you. It's Built. Built with Built Healthy is actually tasty. They're so delicious that you won't think they're good for you. They're perfect for your New Year's resolution. If you've continued on your New Year's resolution, good for you. Built Bar, they're delicious. They're covered in 100% real chocolate, and they come in delicious flavors like churro, peanut butter brownie, and coconut almond. And they taste like a candy bar while maintaining amazing macros. They're, most of the bars are only 130 calories, 4 grams of sugar, and 17 grams of protein. And now you don't need to wait around for your box. For years, we've been telling you about ordering your Built Bars at Built.com. You can still do that if you'd like, but you can also go to your local Walmart or Sam's Club. So head to your local Walmart today, walk to the pharmacy section, and grab yourself a box of Built Bars. You can pick up a four-bar box of cookies and cream, double, double chocolate, or co- coconut puffs. Or if you're close to Sam's Club, run in and grab a 13-bar box of their, of their hit flavors, brownie, batter, and churro. You can thank me later. And you can always go to Built.com to order your Built Bars. This is the Locked On Jets podcast here on this Tuesday. We're talking about potential offensive players who could be cut for the Jets for salary cap purposes this offseason. We've talked about a couple starters. We've talked about Corey Davis. We've talked about Dwayne Brown. Now I'm going to talk about a guy who's more of a depth player, and he's a fan favorite. And I know people are going to get angry with me for what I'm about to say because he's such a fan favorite, and that's Braxton Berrios. And I have to admit, I've never really understood why this guy is so, why Berrios is so beloved. I, I think he's been perfectly fine. I think he's okay as a backup. 
He had obviously had an excellent season as a return guy back in 2021 when he was first team all pro. But I just never understood why why he got as much praise as he did. I thought he was fine. He's a fine depth player, but you know he was just he became such a fan favorite. In any event, I think Barrios's cap number just is it's a non-starter. I mean he he's going to count 8.2 million dollars against the cap if he's on the team this year, and only 3.2 million in dead money. So you're saving five million dollars against the cap if you if you cut him. That's five million dollars the Jets need. Nothing against Barrios. I mean. Listen, I did not have an issue when the Jets gave him that contract. The question with Barrios, though, was always going to be, was 2021 the start of him building something? Was it was it the first step towards improvement? Or was it just a couple plays that were kind of inflating his numbers? And regrettably, I think it was the latter. You know, he regressed quite a bit as a kick returner this past season. He really was not that effective. And even in 2021, when he had that all-pro year, I mean, his average where he you know, was at the top of the league was based on just a couple of returns and those things come and go as a punt returner uh, you know i used to say he may, always makes the catch i don't think you can say that anymore after the buffalo game I mean, he made some shaky decisions as a punt returner let some balls go that you should not have let go and the other issue with him is that you know he, he has a he has a high average but he never qualifies for the league leaderboard because he never really runs the ball back unless the other team outkicks its coverage so essentially, you're getting a fair catch unless you know unless there's like ten yards in front of him. So I don't think that that's really that great. I think he's fine as a gadget guy. You know that you can throw him, you can get him on an end around at full speed. He's fast. He wasn't that effective in the screen game this year, which is not what you want to. Have. You know, you, you think a return guy would be effective in the screen in the screen game because he'd have the ball in his hands, he'd be reading his blocks. It hasn't worked out. Decent, you know, decent backup slot receiver. He can move the chains on third down, but. Not something you pay $8 million for. And, you know, I guess what it comes down to for me is I feel like a good team, and maybe the Jets, you know, we could debate whether or not the Jets are a good team right now, but I feel like a good team is able to replace Barrio, the players like Barrios on the cheap. You know, whether it's a day three pick, whether they find somebody in free agency who's inexpensive, you have to prioritize at, cert- at a certain point. It's not that you don't want a Barrios on your team. It's that you can't prioritize, you can't give this guy too much money. Because there's just too many other more glaring needs. The, you know, Barrios is a fine player. He's a role player. I think when, you know, in 2021, he was a valuable player for the Jets. Did not make much money. A guy like this is really helpful to your team when he's making nothing. And part of that is because the guy, most guys on the, minim, on the minimum salary don't really produce much for your team. Yeah, so if you get anybody on the minimum salary who's a, even a good role player, that's beating the spread. You're getting more out of that guy than you do tip from a player with that salary almost all the time. So it makes sense. You know, he's a good, he was a good player for the Jets in 2021 at $8 million. You can't bring him back. And I, you know, I think you could say you could take a pay cut. Maybe he would be amenable to it because he seems to like being with the Jets. The fan base obviously loves him. And I feel like I'm going to be Mr. Most unpopular guy in the room by suggesting cutting him. But I feel like the Jets are a team right now that needs every dollar they can get. They have to figure out certain positions I just feel like Barrios has become a luxury the Jets really cannot afford. So I think he's got, they got to move on from him. You know, his biggest asset heading into the season was as a kickoff returner, but every single year it feels like kickoffs are becoming less and less prevalent in the NFL, and eventually I think they're going to be phased out. So every year that one skill becomes less and less valuable, and he really wasn't that great at it this past year. So I just don't think that he's a guy the Jets can keep around. You know, it maybe if he took a cut all the way down to the, the league minimum or something like that, then it, it could make sense. But I, I, I don't. And listen, if you're upset with me, I actually do think the Jets will probably keep him. And I, I don't know that I'll, I'll agree with it. I think the Jets love him. I think Joe Douglas loves him. I think the coaching staff loves him. I mean, I think he's clearly a good locker room guy because the last two coaching staffs, you have to remember, Adam Gase really liked Barrios. They played him a lot, probably played him a little bit too much. Uh, so. I think the Jets will keep him around, so you won't have to be mad at me. I just think they should move on, though, because I think that that's just $5 million that they need. $5 million that can be spent better elsewhere. $5 million that it's essential that they spend elsewhere. But I don't know if it's going to happen. I, I wouldn't be surprised if he was back. I don't think he's coming back at his current salary. I think a pay cut will be in order, but could very well, you know, he could very well be back. I, I think the Jets should move on, though. Anyway, that's all for today's episode. This has been the Locked On Jets podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day is our motto. As always, if you enjoy the show, hit the subscribe button where you're watching or listening so that you'll never miss an episode. If you're listening on a podcast source, please give the show a five-star review. If you're watching on YouTube, please a big thumbs up. These things help the channel out and help other Jets fans find the podcast. Have a great Tuesday, everybody. Send in your mailbag questions. Tomorrow we will have our weekly mailbag show.